Charlotte Stoker's account of the cholera horror that she experienced as a young girl in 1832. This written a letter to Bram Stoker in 1875. Copyright Bram Stoker Estate, 2014. In the days of my early youth, the world was shaken with the dread of a new and terrible plague which was desolating all lands as it passed through them. And so regular was its march that men could tell where next it would appear and almost the day when it might be expected. It was the cholera, which for the first time appeared in Western Europe. Its bitter strange kiss and man's want of experience or knowledge of its nature or how best to resist its attacks added, if anything could, to its horrors. In those days, I lived with my parents and brothers in a provincial town in the west of Ireland called Sligo. It was long before the time of railroads, and I think of steamboats, as news traveled slowly. Rumors of the Great Plague broke on us from time to time, as men talk of far-off things which could never come near themselves, but gradually the terror grew on us, as we heard of it coming nearer and nearer. It is in France, they said. It is in Germany. It is in England. Then, with wild affright, we began to hear the whisper past, It is in Ireland. Men's senses began failing them for fear, and deeds were done in selfish dread, enough to call down God's direct vengeance on us. One action I vividly remember a poor traveller was taken ill on the roadside some miles from the town. And how did those Samaritans tend him? They dug a pit and with long poles pushed him living into it and covered him up quick, alive. Severally, like Sodom, did our city pay for such crimes. Trenches were now cut across the roads in the direction in which the cholera was said to come, concisely for the purpose of stopping all intercourse with the infected districts. No use, no use. One evening we heard that a Mrs. Feeney, a very fat woman who was a music teacher, had died suddenly, and by the doctor's orders had been buried an hour after. With blanched faces, men looked at each other and whispered, Cholera! But the whispers next day deepened to a roar, and in many houses lay one, nay two or three dead. One house would be attacked and the next spared, there was no telling who would go next, and when one said goodbye to a friend, he said it as if forever. In a few days, the town became a place of the dead. No vehicles moved except for the cholera carts or doctor's carriages. Many people fled, and many of these were overtaken by the plague and died by the way. Some of the doctors made a good thing of it, as they said themselves, at first but one by one they too became victims, and others came and filled the gaps, and then others again filled their places. Most of the clergy of all denominations fled, and few indeed were the instances in which the funeral service was read over the dead. The great county infirmary and fever hospital was turned into a cholera hospital, but was quite insufficient to meet the requirements of the situation. The nurses died one after another, and none could be found to fill their places but women of the worst descriptions, who were always more than half drunk, and such scenes were perpetrated there as would make the flesh creep to hear of it. One Roman Catholic priest remained. There may have been others, but I knew only of this one. His name was Gillern, and he told us himself that he was obliged to sit day after day, night after night, on top of the great stone stairs with a horse whip, to prevent those wretches dragging the patients down the stairs by the legs with their heads dashing on the stone steps before they were dead. The habit was when a new batch arrived for whom there were no beds, to take those who were stupefied from opium and nearest death and remove them to make room for the new arrivals. Many were said to be buried alive. One man brought his wife to the hospital on his back and she being in great agony he tied a red scarf tightly round her waist to try to relieve the pain. When he came again to the hospital in the evening, he heard that she was dead and lying in the dead house. He sought her body, 
to give it a more decent burial than could be given there. The custom was to dig a large trench, put in 40 or 50 corpses without coffins, throw lime on them and cover the grave. He saw the corner of his red scarf under several bodies, which he removed, found his wife, and saw that there was still life in her. He carried her home, and she recovered and lived many years. There was a remarkable character in the town, a man of great stature, who had been a soldier, and was usually known as Long Sergeant Callan. He took the cholera, was thought dead, and a coffin was brought. As the coffin maker had always a stack of coffins ready on hand, with the burials following immediately on the desks. They were much of a uniform size and, of course, too short for Long Sergeant Callan. The men who were putting him in, when they found he would not fit, took a big hammer to break his legs and make him fit. The first plow rousted the sergeant from his stupor, and he started up and recovered. I often saw the man afterwards. Our own household gradually ceased to go out or hear what went on outside. The last evening we were out, we went to see the family of the collector of excise, Mr. Holmes. They were a large family, father, mother, grandmother, three or four sons, three daughters, and a little grandchild. We left the mall well at 9 p.m. The next morning at 9 o'clock, we heard that Mr. Holmes, his mother, two sons, a daughter, the little child, were all dead and buried. After that, which occurred the sixth day of the cholera, we stayed pretty much in the house. There was a constant fumigation kept up. Plates of salt, on which vitriolic acid was poured from time to time, were placed outside all the windows and the doors. Every morning, as soon as we awoke, a dose of whiskey, thickened with ginger, was given us all, in quantities according to our ages. Gradually, the street in which we lived thinned out, as by twos and threes our dead neighbors were carried away. One morning, the ninth day, four were carried at once dead out of the opposite house. Our neighbors on both sides died. On one side, a little girl called Mary Sheridan was left alone and sick, and we could hear her cries. I begged my mother's leave to help her, and she let me go with many fears. Poor Mary died in my arms an hour after. I returned home, and being well fumigated, was not affected. Some descriptions of provisions became almost impossible to get. Milk, most of all, as none of the country people could be induced to come near the doomed town. We had a cow, and many persons, ladies whom did not know except by sight, used to come and beg a little milk for their young children. The jugs used to be left on the doorstep, filled and taken away. At night, many tar barrels and other combustible matters used to be burned along the street to try to purify the air, and they had a weird, unearthly look. Gleaming out in the darkness, the cholera carts and cots had bells, which added to the horror, and the coffin maker, a man named Young, used to knock on the doors to inquire if any coffins were wanted. This was a climax hard to bear. Few nerves could stand it, and we asked Young to desist. But still he would come, and one day I told him that if he came, I would throw water on him. Next day he knocked as usual, and out went the full of a big jug on his head. The fellow shook himself, looked at me with a diabolical grin, shook his fist and said, If you die in an hour, you shall not have a coffin. Thank you, said I. In that case, I shan't care. He came no more.